Our next speaker is Liam Bailey, uh, Global Head of Research at Knight Frank. And Liam is going to talk about the outlook for Prime's London residential property. And he will also put the UK into context with the broader global property market and investment trends. Um, I will do both of those things in a slightly roundabout way. Actually. Um, what I thought I would do is to um, draw on some of the results from this year's um, Wealth Report, which we're launching uh, this week, um, and look really at the broader context for the prime London market, um, and just look at the kind of themes that we are seeing in the market, which I think really uh, come back to some of the comments we heard earlier about um, London's uh, position uh, as, a, as a global hub uh, for property investment. Um, I'm going to touch on two themes in particular, global demand or globalisation of demand for property and also what you might call the kind of counter trend of protectionism from governments um, here um, and in, um, in, in the rest of the world. Uh, why, why does wealth matter? So in the wealth report that we've been producing for nine years now, we study the investment habits of the wealthy uh, in a global context. And the reason for doing it is primarily because um, these people move markets or they certainly move prime markets in terms of their, their influence on, uh, on property uh, marketplaces. Uh, first of all, you can see here that actually the, um, the, non, the proportion of uh, the wealth is um, wealth in uh, their first and second home portfolio, according to the results of the wealth report, is about 23% uh, of their net assets and uh, about 26% of our high net worth individuals, according to the wealth report this year, are planning on investing in uh, another residential property in 2015, which is great news for. Uh, estate agents. I hope this doesn't keep running actually. Um, in terms of commercial property, about 25% of global uh, commercial property investment is held by private investors, uh, and we're forecasting about $47 billion of new investment in commercial property globally this year. Well, this is going to work quickly. Um, in terms of. Uh, <laughs> So you have this, this sort of narrative of growing, um, uh, growing interest in investment from uh, wealthy uh, individuals uh, across, the, across the world. In terms of where they're looking to invest, we have a survey within the Wealth Report called our Global Cities Survey. And this um, looks to try to understand which the cities in the world which matter to uh, wealthy individuals. Here we are, we can see them. Um, London comes out number one in our 2015 results, the most important city in the world in terms of lifestyle, investment, networking, education for children for the world's wealthy. And you can see by magic, um, in 2025, um, New York is expected to pip London in terms of that, that position as the most important city um, to the wealthy. And the reason for that actually is this issue around the dominance of these two cities, actually, behind these rankings, that um, the dominance of London and New York against the rest of the pack is enormous. Note also, before it clicks on, there we go, there was four cities there in Asia, the biggest global hub for um, our important global cities um, uh, based in Asia. And this comes into this issue around growth of wealth or wealth creation around the world. These are the top ten cities around the world for um, numbers of wealthy uh, individuals. And you can see seven out of our 10 forecast um, cities where there's forecast growth of an ultra high net worth population over the next um, decade are located in Asia. Five of our top 10 cities are, um, account for around 10% of all future forecast growth in the population of the super, um, super wealthy. Uh, people with more than $30 million or more. And this points to one of these themes around this sort of growing concentration of wealth. The key hubs around the world are becoming more important over time. And in fact, as we'll see in a second, here we go, this trend is not likely to reverse anytime soon. One of the questions we ask in the Wealth Report is uh, which of the biggest, um, or sort of one of the pieces of research we've done is looking at the biggest inflows and outflows of high net worth individuals. These are people more than $1 million or more uh, to invest, where have they been moving from and where have they been moving to over the past decade. This data comes from, uh, from Fragment, uh, the international um, uh, migration or immigration um, lawyers. 
These are the net exporters, big movements from places like China, Russia, India, probably unsurprisingly. Quite surprisingly, the, the net movement of um, high net worth individuals from France, Italy, Eurozone crisis, etc., etc., but also Switzerland, a net um, loser of, uh, or a sort of a, a net exporter of the wealthy over the past uh, decade. Where have they been moving to? The biggest recipient um, has been the UK, otherwise known as London, 14,000 of them. And then again, the US, so effectively it's New York, it's Miami, it's LA, or Vancouver, Dubai, Hong Kong, Singapore, Sydney. So it's the key hubs again being the main destinations of choice for the wealthy when they're moving around the world. And we believe that the trends are really pointing towards um, this movement of people only going in one direction. We ask a question in our attitude survey, the wealth of all proportion of the ultra high net worth um, are looking to change domicile or residence uh, at the current time, or they're, they're currently planning on that move. And you can see here, it's huge numbers, 33% of Russian and CIS uh, ultra high net worth individuals, probably unsurprising, current time. 15% in Latin America, but actually bizarrely within Europe, 14%, only just behind Latin America, and behind uh, Russia and the CIS. So significant movements of people, again, driving this globalization thesis with lots of these movements feeding into property investments in places like London. So if you look ahead, think about trends around education. 42%, 50% of Chinese and Russian wealthy planning to send their children overseas for secondary education. So actually, again, we, in our own experience, all of this feeding into demand uh, for property and leading to, to potential uh, exponential growth in demand over time. It's very quick, it's going to whiz over. Uh, we work with uh, NetJets this year. One thing we're very interested in this year's wealth report is looking at connectivity, linkages between uh, cities and locations, trying to understand these wealth flows in more details. These are the most popular uh, private jet routes at the current time. You've got. Uh, um, here we go. Um, so what you've got here is two hubs. America, the biggest, deepest, most mature market for private jet travel uh, in the world, centered on New York and Miami. And this rather neat circle here from Moscow, South France, into London, probably unsurprising to all of us, that other hub for private jet travel. And New York and London acting as the kind of conduit between all of these, um, these, these trends. Again, confirming the centrality of those two cities to the wealthy. We then ask a question of NetJets and uh, Euro, monitor, Euro Control. What are the fastest growing private jet routes at the current time? Quite a neat one here from uh, Caracas going into Miami. You've also got Lagos and Dubai coming into London. And again, sort of um, reinforcing the story of this um, importance of key hubs in terms of movements of wealth, destinations um, of choice for the wealthy at the current time. So we have this issue of, on the plus side, in terms of a, a high-end estate agency business in London, more wealth around the world, more buyers, there's more demand, and that demand is increasingly focused on key markets like London. In 2014, it's fair to say that Chinese demand suddenly went mainstream, in the sense that actually there was a trickle before 2014. It became much bigger uh, in the past 12, um, 12 months. So why question that direction of travel right now, when actually we're seeing much more uh, investment coming into uh, places like uh, like London. I think we've heard about property taxes in the UK, but they're not um, they're not unique. What we've seen with things like stamp duty, CGT, ATEN, etc. Similar trends are happening in other parts of the world, and pr primarily this comes around this reaction against wealth, this, this this sort of concern in local markets that we are seeing. We're seeing a uh, pushback. Um, because actually wealth in significant concentrations can lead to unaffordability or access to market issues for local residents. And you're seeing the same trends, certainly in Singapore and Hong Kong, big tax increases there aimed at Chinese investors, but also talks around second home taxes in New York, San Francisco, Paris, uh, and other locations around the world at the current time. The exporting countries, Russia for example, introducing reporting requirements on anyone requiring or looking for second citizenship and an additional passport. Uh, Moscow getting much hotter in terms of trying to control that process uh, and making it much more of a political um, process. 
and also locations where people are moving to become more difficult uh, in Switzerland's case in terms of security residency uh, requirements and capital controls. The assumption is that in our markets that actually over time capital controls are eased and relaxed and therefore money can flow across borders easier. Actually, you've seen in the past 12 months that places like India, Cyprus, Ukraine uh, and other locations around the world, you've seen actually capital controls tightening over time. So actually it's kind of the opposite of what we might expect um, to happen. And just this week in Australia, another debate around potentially restrictions on foreign buyers. So all of this globalisation, this movement of money around the world, which has been powering markets like London, is, is leading to this kind of uh, this, this pushback on lots of different levels um, from, from governments. Very quickly, just to put the London market into context, let's just see what's been happening to um, property markets, prime property markets around the world over the past 12 months. Um, the US led last year, New York, very strong price growth, at the top end, about 19%. Strong local economy and also safe haven flows from around the world moving into that market. Ditto Miami, LA, San Francisco. If we move into Europe, much more complicated, uh, or much more diverse trends at play. London market, as we all know, central London slowed down in 2014. Double digit growth fell to about 5% by the end of the year. End of the cycle, really, at the current time, but also fears of mansion tax, etc., etc. You also see in the Eurozone, sort of periphery, Madrid and Dublin on the rise at the current time, a bit of a bounce from their crash, but also uh, actively encouraging overseas investment into those markets. Despite Moscow's attempt to stem the outflow of capital, prices still fell uh, in Moscow last year. Um, Switzerland's had a difficult time for the last two years. Zurich prices down 8%, and that process is still continuing. But Berlin, quite an interesting one, Germany acting more and more as a uh, safe haven destination for investors from southern Europe at the current time. And finally, uh, looking at the rest of the world, I think quite a Dubai saw a big uh, downturn, obviously 2006, 2007, been a big bounce in the last few years. That cycle seems to come to an end. We've got zero growth here. Some schemes are seeing prices fall at the current time. Istanbul is increasingly, um, our partners over there are reporting a lot of renewed interest from the Middle East in terms of investment as a sort of safe haven within the region. Uh, and then moving over to uh, Asia finally, Singapore, a uh, classic uh, location where this idea of cooling measures has really driven prices backwards at the current time. And then Sydney, Strong growth in the last few years, but actually this issue around um, this issue around restrictions on foreign buyers could lead uh, to a slowdown in that market. Final slide. I think the in, in summary that this on the on the plus side, I suppose this this desire for more global demand from investors around the world um, will, will will continue. There will be this sort of this increased demand over time. I think in terms of um, controls on, on, on wealth flow, I think we we'll expect more of that, not just in the UK, but in other locations around the world. There's a big narrative around that at the current time. I think potentially, you may, all, you may just disagree with me, but I think potentially we are in this world of greater compliance, greater transparency, uh, greater sort of uh, openness of information. There is an argument, I think, potentially in London's position, and maybe even for New York and the other established markets, that actually this is one of our strengths, and actually this thing around transparency of title and actually this kind of increased emphasis on KYC, know your client, etc., actually probably an advantage uh, for uh, our market uh, in the long term. That's me done. Thank you very much.